and the messenger training and our staff and all the DTSs. He's doing something for the hour that we're in. And then the next night, we had another thing where we pushed all the chairs back and there was a lot, a lot of people in here. And many, 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 many people were being filled with the Holy Spirit and fire. And I say that if you don't know what I mean, there's people that didn't even have a grit for speaking in tongues. And they're freaking out saying, why is my tongue doing this? It's not supposed to do this. Getting filled with the Holy Spirit, people getting lit up and getting touched by the Holy Spirit, people crying and getting set free of different areas in their life. As they're praying in, in the Spirit, they're getting set free of shame. Someone got set free of unforgiveness, years of unforgiveness she's been, she's been harboring in her heart for years. Got set free in that night and God spoke to her to forgive those people in her life. God's been doing some amazing things and we've only just begun. But I believe tonight there's something special. And the reason why Josh McDonald is here is because I know this guy. He has authority in this area in his life to be a witness wherever he goes. And I get it. We can preach the gospel and we can evangelize. We want to, we want to begin to build relationship and connect. And that's good. But there's another term we call power evangelism. And that's something that every single one of us have been invited into. And we can walk in that because Jesus said we can. Amen? And this guy walks in that and everywhere he goes... Follow him on Instagram, follow him on Facebook, literally his entire family, he has his little son that follows him everywhere he goes. And literally he'll be at the mall and his son will literally say, hey dad, you see that guy in the broken cast? Let's get him. Yeah. And Josh will go, all right son, let's do it. I'm talking about a guy who's walked this out so much, his son walks it out just as much as he does. Come on. That says something. And that's what God's doing. And I just believe there's an impartation. I say that word to say this. He has authority in it, meaning there's an invitation to actually release that on us in this room. And so I want you to do this. Would you stand on your feet all over this room? Just because I want us to start off on the right foot. And I know God's already done so much. And everything we've talked about tonight is in that vein of reaching the lost and evangelism. But I want you to do this. Would you just do this so we can set a timer because I'm a preacher and I'll go too long. For the next 60 seconds, I want you to do this. Would you just begin to lift your voice all over this room? You can even lift your hands to heaven right now all over this room from the front to the back. And I just want you to begin to invite the Lord in this room right now. Come on, every person, messenger students, students, SBS, come on, God, come on, the sounds Jesus, Jesus, God, we hope you
We invite you, come. Show your glory to us, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Stay standing. Will you guys put your hands together and welcome my friend? going to go right back into that just for a minute. I just want us to, again, lift our voices to the Lord. An anointing really came into the room, and I know sometimes what can happen is, is when we have a time frame, we can go like this a lot because we're, we're conscious of time. So if God wants to show up and I don't preach, that's fine. Yeah. So let's just, just for a second, Lydia, let's go back into some worship just for a second, and let's just wait on the Lord a little bit longer. Because who knows, an angel could come into the room right now and heal everybody. Yeah. And so, no, really. His, 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 his color is bronze, and he's for healing. So, right now, let's just lift our hands one more time to the Lord. This isn't hype. This isn't anything. This isn't hype. So, Father, we thank you, Jesus. And God, we ask you for something beyond ourselves to come into this room tonight. God, we are asking for an angelic presence to come. God, that would touch our lives and set us on fire for the next season. God, we are the season. And so we just know that God has put us in a strategic place and that the gold and silver are his. And I believe even with this Donald Trump stuff and so many things that are happening right now, I believe that we're about to see some crazy transference of wealth. And I know we've been saying that forever, you know, the wealth of the wicked is start over the righteous. But, but really, for real, I think there's some amazing things coming. And I think, I think the most important thing that we can do as believers, other than being sons and other than, you know, having a relationship with Jesus, is being people that understand the times that we live. It's the most important thing because so many Christians understand what God's doing personally with them. And that's awesome. We need to know that. But I think what's so important is that we move beyond just what the Lord is saying to us personally. And that we can actually be a true kingdom citizens where we actually know beyond, you know, this in my own personal life is happening. But that we be true kingdom sons of God that can actually stand in a city, stand in a nation, and actually begin to pick up in the spirit about what the Lord is actually saying in the world right now. Yeah. And I know he's saying a lot of things, and I don't ever want to be a prophetic voice who thinks that he knows the number one thing God is saying, because God's an interesting God where he says 17 subjects to 17 different prophets, and they're all him, you know? But I believe that God is raising up true sons of Issachar, a generation of people. You know, in First Chronicles 12, there's this tribe of the sons of Issachar car and it said that they had understanding of the times but not just understanding of the times but they knew what the people of God ought to do with those times and I believe that right now one of the greatest questions that we can ask and have the answer for is what time is it you know it's actually the greatest it's actually I googled this it's one of the num top 10 most frequently asked questions by all humans in the world what time is it hey bro what time is it hey you know what time it is 
Right? We say that all the time. You check your watch. What time is it? It's so important that in the spirit, we be a people who, when someone asks us, do you know what time it is? I can say, yes, I know what time it is. You know? And, and so I think that one of the things that the Lord is saying, and what he's been saying through me now for about a year and a half, is just one of the things he's saying. He's saying a lot of things. Is that I believe that we are this word double portion. I know we've heard it so much in the charismatic church. But I believe that this word double portion is what we're coming into. That we are literally, this is going to sound heretical, but I promise I'm going somewhere with it. That we are literally coming into the double portion of Jesus Christ on the earth. Jesus said in John 14, 12, you guys all know it. That we, as the people of God, those who believe in Him, will do the same works. And then He went on to say the most inaccurate, unbiblical thing you could ever say. That you will go on to do the greater works than even I did. And remember, I'm God. That people are going to move into a time in history. I believe that we're not there yet. You know, it's, it's a great heroic thing to say to stir faith for miracles, but I don't think we've transitioned into the time of history yet where literally believers are walking in greater than what Jesus did. I mean, when you think about what Jesus did, it's beyond the blind man getting healed. It's beyond the lame getting healed. It's beyond the, you know, the guy getting set free of all his demons, the legions of demons. It goes beyond that. It goes back to Genesis 1, that when Jesus, before Abraham was out there, it goes back to God, Jesus speaking the earth into existence. Yeah. That we're literally coming into a time where God's going to use his people that no matter whatever you say is actually going to happen in the media. If you need a financial miracle, it's not going to be even about raising funds anymore. We're going to come into a time where God's going to entrust us with such authority that if I need a miracle, I will speak it forth into my law and it'll be there. You know what I mean? We're really coming into that time of history. And I believe that the Lord is God. I believe that one of the, the time that we're living in is this double portion thing. But we have to position ourselves for it. So in Malachi 4, we know that in the last days, God's going to do what? He's going to pour out the spirit and power of Elijah, right? And so how many of you believe that you, know, you just heard Joel get up here and say, we are close to fulfilling literally the Great Commission. I mean, what we've read about for 2,000 years in our Bible is what Jesus spoke. I mean, this is crazy stuff. And I remember back in 2009, you know, Bickle saying these things with, 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 with Mark Anderson. And I remember Bickle started burning with this stuff seven years ago. Like, guys... This is freaky. I remember, I remember it like radically changed Mike's perspective. You know, because Mike Bickle's like the end time teacher of all end time teachers. And then Mark Anderson shows up at his door one day and says, Mike, you know we're like 10 years out from the Great Commission being fulfilled. You know? And so if we're really living in the last days, God said he's going to give the spirit and power of Elijah. So that means I think we need to pay attention to Elijah a little bit and figure out what was it that this guy Elijah was walking in. Yes, I know it says that it's going to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, but I want to look even beyond the turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and actually look at Elijah's life. We're talking about a man who was entrusted with something greater almost than anything we've ever seen. We're talking about a man that was entrusted by the Lord to call down fire on a bay altar when needed. The same thing that the disciples who walked with Jesus tried to do and didn't have authority to do so. Isn't that interesting? The disciples who are walking with Jesus tried to do the same thing Elijah did, but their life was not accounted worthy enough to have that kind of authority. And Jesus rebukes them and says, what are you guys doing? Because they're just going, well, Elijah did it. See, but I believe that a lot, there, there was a formula to Elijah's life that I believe entrusted him with that. And I'm going to try to weave all of this together with signs and wonders of evangelism. And this is just the way we've lived. But if you, I, I'm, just, I'm not going to open my word right now, but just, just hear me out and we'll study this stuff later. I don't, I'm, a, I'm, more of a, I'm a preacher, not a teacher. So if I try to open my Bible, I won't have time to get out what I'm trying to say. But in 1 Kings 17 is when we see Elijah come on the scene, right? Elijah shows up on the scene. Bam! Elijah the fish bite. And we know this guy is walking in some unusual authority because the first thing that we read about his life is that he himself is being used by God to hold a drought over Israel. Do you realize that? We forget that God, when he put that drought over Israel, he was actually doing it through a human. Because Elijah says, and I'm paraphrasing, it's not going to rain until I say so. So God entrusted the drought of Israel to a man and trusted that when he says it's going to rain, it's going to rain. So the guy's clearly already walking in something, but then even in the midst of walking in that level of power, he was humble enough to realize that there was more, and God speaks to him and says, I want you to get away from here, and I want to go take you to this wilderness place called the Brook Cherith, 
And, and so long story short, he goes into the brook Cherith, and I know that the, the scriptures say that he was fed by ravens, but I believe it had, it, it, I don't think it was like what we think. I think it was a challenge. I think it was a struggle because when he comes out of those wilderness seasons, he goes right to the widow's house demanding a cake to be baked for him. You know, so I think, I think it was a challenging season, but the point is, is the Lord never said to Elijah, hey, if you go to the brook Cherith, there you're going to get prepared for a Mount Carmel shutdown against Ahab. Right? The Lord didn't say that. But see, Elijah was so hungry for the Lord and so in a place of maturity that even though he was walking in that much authority, that when the Lord said, go to the wilderness, he said, okay, Lord, because if Elijah wouldn't have went to the brook chair, I don't think he would have had authority to call down fire on Mount Carmel. I don't think he would have had the maturity to do it yet in that season. So Elijah goes away, even though he's already walking in ridiculous power. Goes away for this season of pre preparation, of fasting and prayer, whatever you want to call it, you know, consecration, whatever. But he comes out of that season with a new measure of power, and the Lord uses him to call down fire on a male altar. And then what's amazing is, is he's walking in this crazy new level of power that wasn't there before the fast. Now he's got this power, and then all of a sudden, this man named Elisha... Is found faithful doing what? Tending the field and plowing, being a faithful servant. And Elijah comes and walks by him. And there was something about Elisha's life of being faithful in the plowing that when Elijah walked by him, he was able to walk in his mantle. But then check this out. Even though Elisha had received Elijah's mantle, he didn't go start his itinerant ministry. He actually stopped what he was doing and went and served the man that technically he already has the mantle of. And because he humbled himself and did that, there was going to be there was going to come a later time where he, where Elijah was going to ask Elisha, "Hey, so what would you like for me before I leave?" And he says, "How about the double portion of your man?" That's intense stuff. He received Elijah's mantle and didn't do anything with it. Instead, hid it and actually prepared himself for the more. And the Lord said, good job, son, because you could have taken that mantle and wrote all your books and got all your teaching series out. And you could have been the next great apostle. But instead, you went and served this man and continued to remain low. Now I'll give you the double portion of that. And I love what the Lord is doing here in Kansas City and with the messengers because he's taking the signs and wonders, prophetic go movement. But, but then he's also taking them and getting them to understand the, the reality of fasting and prayer. And then the other side of the spectrum, the guys that have been fasting and prayer are getting lit up for evangelism. And when those two worlds come together, we're going to see an explosion of power. Because the guys that are walking in power now that think there's no value in fasting and prayer are going to tap out at a certain level. Yeah. Because God is right now, we're in a second chronicles time where the eyes of the Lord are searching to and fro throughout the earth, searching for hearts that are fully his. And in the same way that he was doing that in Mary's day to find out who he could impregnate with himself, God is looking around the earth and he's saying, I saw that three days of fasting. I saw that offering you gave in secret. I saw all of those sacrifices that you made. Keep it up because there's a time coming in human history where I'm going to tip the scales and those that have been faithful all of these years are going to get literal Elijah power. Power, and they're going to begin to walk in the double portion of what I walked in because the level of darkness that's coming to the earth requires the greatest level of power that the earth has ever seen. There are guys in the demonic that are doing way crazier stuff than any of you have ever, any of us have ever tapped in, in the in God's side of the camp. But we're coming into a time where as things get worse and worse and worse, there's, there's going to be a, we're coming into another Mount Carmel type showdown in our nation again. Now I'm not talking about we're literally going to you know, call down fire and burn the White House. But the point is, is God is, God is raising up sons and daughters of God, guys, that are truly image bearers of Jesus Christ, literally walking in the things that the Bible tells us. Like I said to you guys this morning at I have you, Second or Second Corinthians, that we diffuse the fragrance of His knowledge in every place. And I've been in this journey um, for the past. I've been in this journey for the past four or five years. Where the Lord's been taking me in these journeys of giving me opportunity to receive impartation and then taking it serious, calling a fast, and watching what the Lord has been doing. 
I remember when I got to a point in 2012 where I was sick and tired of going out and doing outreach and not seeing anything happen. I was doing outreach because I should, and that's what Christians do, and we weren't seeing nothing. We weren't seeing miracles. We weren't seeing signs and wonders. And I didn't even have language for it because I had no example. I was a new Christian. I wasn't really super familiar with what's going on at Bethel and whatever, but I just didn't have language for it. And I began to watch these videos by a man named Ryan Herbonke. And I began to watch these, these this is back in 2012. I began to watch these, these African crusades and and I just go, man, I want this. And I remember I began to secretly fast. I began to do these little fasts, asking God whatever that guy's walking in, I want it. And then a week later, when I, when I began to do these, I did like these two, like I did this like two day thing where I started fasting. And I just started purposing my heart, saying, God, I want to be, I want to be someone that can walk in that. You know, not claiming that I have everything I need in Christ. God, thank you. Now I'm going to go do it. No, that's a man who's paid a price, who's walked in something. And I remember the Lord saw that. He saw that hunger in my heart. And little did I know that in about a week and a half, I was going to receive an email that said I'm invited to go spend a week with him for seven days. And I remember we fa- me and my buddies, we fasted eight days before we went. And we received an impartation of a lifetime. And I went from living a life of no miracles to overnight walking in signs and wonders. The next day after being with Ryan, I prayed for a girl with one leg six inches shorter than the other, an S-shaped spine, born with scoliosis. Leg grows out, her spine snaps back straight, and, and there was a change happening. But then even in that season, we knew there was more, and I was asking God for more and more, and I was fasting, and I was asking Him for more, and we're, we're seeing stuff, we crazy stuff, go, go into the emergency room and pick people up out of their wheelchairs. All outreach was out the window. This is what we do now. <laughs> Guys, let's go do outreach. That was out the window. What else do we have to do than go outreach? Let's go, you know? I remember calling my buddies up and saying, we're going to the emergency room tonight. And one of those nights, we saw a crippled lesbian Buddhist walk out of the wheelchair. Yeah, I said that. Crippled lesbian Buddhist. True story. True story. But even in that place, there was this ache for more. There was this ache for more. And then my wife has this dream during that time where I was like, we're walking in so much, but there's so much more. Reese and I were in Florida. We prayed for a man named Glenn Hicks who was dying of stage four bone cancer, eight months to live. We lay hands on him. And less than 10 hours later, he's at the doctor's with, and his blood results are showing up with no more cancer. Oh, we're talking about less than a day later. We pray for him on a night. He goes into the doctor's the next morning, completely healed of stage four bone cancer. Healed, for real, for real, healed. He ended up breaking his leg like a year later, and the doctors go, dude, Glenn, you have like the healthiest bones we've ever seen. Wow. <laughs> you know, crazy stuff, but, but we still ask God for more. And during that time of asking God for more, my wife has this dream, and in the dream, I'm driving to Dallas, Texas, and I said, honey, I'm on my way to Dallas, Texas right now to receive an impartation for the healing revival that's coming to America. Right? What do you do with a dream like that? My wife has this dream. So what are we going to do? Well, somehow we're going to go to Dallas, Texas, and somehow we're going to receive. See, it takes humility, though, and hunger to say, okay, I'm going to go for that. Even though I was already walking in more than probably anybody else around me, hey, there's more. There's more. There's more. There's more. And so my wife has this dream. I go to Reese, and I go to Jess, and I said, guys, my friend Reese and Jess, I go to him, and I said, dude, my wife had this dream. I have no idea what it means. All I know is that Christ the Nation Institute is in Dallas. And that was birthed out of the Voice of Healing era of the 40s and 50s with William Crano and those guys. And I don't know how this is going to work. I believe we don't have a plan, but somehow we're going to receive an impartation. And we fasted seven days. And said, God, here we go. And we went on a journey to Texas with no agenda. We didn't know what the heck we were doing. That led us to Dutch Sheets. That led us to having personal time with Dutch. That led him to publicly laying hands on us and going in travail over us and imparting what he calls the mantle for freaky miracles. <laughs> And it, was, and it was two days later after that that we prayed for the lady in Dallas who had the leaking bowels and her heart closed up. And we've been on this journey of just walking in some and being a faithful witness everywhere we go and saying, God, this is what we have to have, guys. This is what the world needs. The world needs something greater than church because there's too many churches. Our nation has way too much Jesus in it. I know that sounds crazy to think. But what I mean by that is the name of Jesus is so over familiar in our nation. And the most of the people that are representing his name are doing a bad job representing his name. And that's why the world says, F you Christians, you want nothing to do with you. If if we truly are representing his nature, if we truly were being like him, there's not a lost person in the world that doesn't want Jesus. That that doesn't mean everyone's going to be saved. But there's not a lost person in this world who if they truly experienced who God really was would turn their back on them. They would say, I don't want that. No way. 
Would you? You know, you know his goodness now. You know his goodness now. Don't you guys all know that if they just knew what we had, there's no way they could deny God. Yeah. See, it's going to take a faith. It's going to take a people that know their sons that are resting in their father's goodness. You guys heard me talk about sonship this morning. It's almost the opposite message of what I preached this morning. This morning I said, go out and hit golf balls on a golf course and stop fasting for a year if you need to. Who was with me this year? This morning, I, was, I said, I told you guys how I fasted from fasting for a year, you know? So this is like the opposite. So it's a good thing you're here on the other side of me. Right? So you don't think I'm a hyper grace guy, you know, or something. But, uh, but we just begin to contend for more and more and more because the world out there, guys, needs this. They need something greater than what the TV show is showing them. They need something greater than the Baptist church on the street. I'm not, I didn't, I didn't I should even have said the Baptist. I didn't mean that in a specific way. But they need something greater than that because our evangelism tactics these days are this. Invite your friend to church. Are you kidding me? I brought my friend to your church. Like, what is he going to want? You know what I mean? I, this church. What, what the world needs is the people of God getting lit with faith to believe that that person limping is going to be healed. Yes. They're going to be lit with faith to believe that that person needs God. That when that, when that crazy demonized man gets on the subway and starts banging his face off the wall, that I have the answer. Come on. This really happened two weeks ago. Whoa. I'm sitting on the subway, guys. You, you know, in New York, I'm a little, so I moved to New York City. And, you know, it's overwhelming because... What you have in New York City that's different than like Kansas City or normal cities is see here in Kansas City or Michigan where I originally come from, people are really good about hiding their stuff. Unbelievers are like, everyone acts like they got their crap together and it's like there's that, there's those, there's a few of those random homeless guys on the corner, but for the most part everyone's hiding their junk. See in New York City it's the totally opposite. In New York City a girl that's clearly that's, you know, shot out shooting heroin will get on the bus and tell you she's a heroin addict and she's been raped 20 times. And she'll just say it publicly and ask for money. And you get so, and see, as a believer, I'm saying, God, I am, don't you ever, 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 ever let me grow numb to this. Because here's what I watch. All the New Yorkers are numb to that because they've watched it for too long. And I'm sitting there on these subways and I can only wonder how many Christians are on the subway with me. As these people go up and down the aisle. It's insane. These, these people will be sitting on their phones. And who knows how many of them. I'll dare to believe that when I'm on a subway, half the people in there go to church on Sunday. And they sit there and they read their newspaper and they sit on their phone and a girl will get on the subway and talk about how she has been raped 10 times and how her crack dealer just beat her to death. And da 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 And they will walk with, with, with black eyes, scabbed up, shot out people. They will walk up and down the subway begging for money and they will get right in your face like this and shake their cup. And people will literally stare at their phone and ignore them until they walk away. Because they're numb to it. That's what they know. And it's like, oh my gosh, this guy gets on the subway uh, a couple weeks ago. I'm riding back to Brooklyn. I'm by myself. It's in the evening. He gets on the subway, starts manifesting the demons, screaming at everybody. And then I'm sitting right here, and here's one of the doors. He walks up to the door and starts banging his face off the wall. Hard. Like, boom, boom. I'm like, oh my gosh, it's going to break his nose, you know? And, and then he, he probably did it six times. And then just starts beating this door, metal door, I mean, left and right, I mean, hard as you can punch, just losing his mind, pulling his hair, just manifesting. And I can see everyone's getting all worried. And in those moments, as the Son of God, I have a choice to make. I have a choice to make. I can sit and watch, or I can do something, and it's going to cost me something. This, who knows, this guy could manifest, he could fight me, he could beat me up. I have to stand up in front of this whole train, they're going to look at me funny. So, so the door opens, and he walks out, and I follow the guy out. And I was hoping he was going to stay, but he ended up just going to the next train and do it all over again. So, I, so I, I, I'm like right behind him. He's like right here. He's just on a mission. And I walk onto the next train with him. He goes right on the train, does the same exact thing, starts banging his head off the wall. And I have this moment where every, I'm standing, I'm the only guy standing up on the whole subway while this dude is banging his head off the wall. And I got a hundred people just staring at this guy watching. And I have a decision to make. And don't get me wrong, I'm not a super saint. Fear of man was all over me. You know, this is us, it's going to be insane. But I, but I overcame the fear, and I literally grabbed this guy by the back of his shirt like this. I'm not trying to sound like a tough guy, but he was, I mean, this was intense, what he was doing. And I'm like, i got to stop this guy. And I grab him by his shirt, and he turns around and hit me, just like that. And he stops, just stops. And I sit straight. Everyone's watching. Everyone is watching. And I just fold his head. I look him right in the eyes as if it was just me and him in the room. And I said, sir... I so said, you don't need to do that. I said, I promise you that I have everything that you need for your life. Everything. 
I said, it doesn't matter what it is, I will meet it right now. I promise you, I have everything you need. Just look at me, I need you to calm down, and I'm asking you to get off with me at the next stop. <clears throat> and he just kind of stares at me for a good, it felt like forever, probably three seconds. <laughs> and he said, okay. And we get off on the subway stop. And by the time we had walked up the stairs to go over in this really, really busy area of downtown Brooklyn called J Street, and, and right as we're walking up, by the time, within, within 30 seconds, his whole demeanor has changed. All somebody had to do was stand up and not be scared of the demons that are operating in this man's life and show him the peace that the world really wants. I said this to you guys this morning. What the world wants more than anything is peace. Because when everything's going really well for the world, everything's okay. But when their world comes tumbling down, if they still have peace, that's the real answer. They don't care what you have until they see what you have when they see that your life isn't perfect, but yet you're still walking in peace. That's what the world really wants. And here's this guy. And so we go up the stairs and I meet a whole different person. He, he went from this psycho dude banging his face to just a broken orphan son. Broken orphan kid who doesn't know his father. Who's, who knows what's going on in his life. And here's what I say to him. I don't even preach the gospel to him. I said, bro, tell me your story. What's going on, dude? You know, that's how I witnessed the transgender people. Want to know how I witnessed the gospel? I, I sat with one two nights ago on the subway. Want to know how I witnessed to a man who's dressed up like a woman? Bro, I want to hear your skin. Usually I get offended when I say, bro, but I do it on purpose. <laughs> no, I, not, not, not in a sadistic way. Not in a sadistic way at all. Because I want them to know that I'm establishing a truth, but that I'm here to love them regardless. And here's what I say to them. I, I say, bro, I would love to hear your story. Do you have time to share with me your journey of coming out of the closet into the lifestyle? And then I want to know what it was like the day that you actually decided to fully transform yourself to a woman. Can I hear your story? They look at you like you're a maniac. And you just sit there and you listen, you listen, and you listen. And they, and they wonder why you're listening. And you just bring it slightly in there. Well, dude, can I pray for you, man? Because a lot of times what happens is, is the spirit will move in there and end up telling you some very bad things that have happened to him. And from that place you can minister. So I asked this guy, dude, so what's your story? Long story short, he just got out of prison. He'd been in prison for a year. He's homeless on the street. Nothing's working out for him. You know, and he just wants to kill himself. And I said, so I tell him, so I sober walking. I share my whole story with him in a 30 minute version, like 30 minutes. I mean, we walked down the street. I bought him all this stuff. And while I was buying him all this stuff, we were just talking. I shared my story with him. I spend the next hour and a half with this guy. We go out to eat. We have pizza together. And this man leaves. Oh, and I'm not, he, I don't, I'm not, did he get saved? I don't know. I don't know. I'm probably not. But, but, I, but I got him closer to that place. And his countenance changed. And he let me pray for him. He let me bless him. And he just didn't know what to do with this. You know? And he doesn't have a cell phone. So I have no clue what he's doing today. But I trust that, that it, just, like the, just like the man of the Legion of Demons, after getting set free, asked Jesus to jump in the boat. And Jesus himself turned away the man who should have been discipled in our idea. <laughs> and says, go back to your hometown and tell everything that I've done for you. So I trust that God's got this guy. Whether or not he's banging his head again today, he might be. But he's not going to forget the day that that man took his time out of his life, guys. And the point is, is the world is looking for this, guys. And, and it's time for us to do two things. It's time for us to begin to walk as sons of God, to begin to love people as he loved us. Guys, think about this one. In Romans, it says, I think it's like four or five. <clears throat> Romans says that the love of, it's my favorite verse in the whole Bible. I can't even tell you where it is. <laughs> It's because you know why? It's because they got this new Bible. And when you get a new Bible, the same scriptures aren't in your old, they're not there. They're nowhere to be found. <laughs> Who knows what I'm talking about? Every time a new Bible comes out, they leave out the scriptures that I love from the first one. I can't find them anywhere. See, because I really don't know my Bible very well. What it is, is I know that in the top left corner, that one time I highlighted yellow with a great star. And I know that's where that scripture is. But in Romans, somewhere... It says, it says, this is my favorite verse in the whole Bible. It says that the love of God was demonstrated towards us, that yet while we were still sinners, Christ died. Yeah. Where is it? 5.8. I was going to say 5.17. That's kind of good. <laughs> so check this out. Think about the fact that Jesus went to the cross and died for all of humanity that had yet a chance to, 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 to get their life saved. Looking down to 2016 and seeing every person that was going to still deny him any of The same man that said, narrow is the path to my kingdom, and there's very few who will find it. Yet, even though I know there's going to be few, I'll still die for all of humanity anyways. That's bizarre. 
That's bizarre. And see, what you have to understand is, is in the same way that we honor a preacher, in the same way that we honor a believer and a minister, what if we showed the same honor, the same respect, and we looked at unbelievers through the same lens? You know, I just got done reading Sean Bowles' book on the prophetic, his new book, uh, whatever it's called. Translating God. Translating God. And you know what he said in there that was so profound to me? What Sean Bowles said this book was, is, you know, he, he, growing up, they moved all the time. And he said that his mom would always teach him to ask the Lord to show him who his friends were going to be in that city before he even met them. And then once the Lord showed him his, who his new friends were going to be in that city, that then the Lord would show him where, what they looked like at the finish line. So that when, they, when he met these people and became friends with them, regardless of the scandal of sin they get involved in, regardless of how far they get off the path, he has already encountered the Father for them and sees what they're going to look like at the finish line. Yeah. I want Sean Bowles' parents. So here's what we're going to do, honey. We're moving to New York. I shouldn't listen to my kids. We're going to ask the Lord to show us our new friends. Then we're going to see what they're at the finish line. So when they do dumb crap and sleep with their girlfriends and still get high after encountering the love of God, I know what they look like 20 years from now. So therefore, I won't judge them for what they're doing in the moment. Right. In that sense, and see, we have to begin to step into that for the world around us that remember that, yeah, while we were still sinners, Christ died. And so whether it's the guy banging his head on the wall, the girl banging at the street corner in New York, I have to see them for who God created them to be. And I know I went from a crazy double portion to this, but we're here somehow. <laughs> and so my point is, guys, is, is it's time to arise and shine. The occasion is here and we're running out of time. Okay. You know, sometimes I, I get so overwhelmed because, you know, I'm in a city, right? I'm in New York City with millions of people walking by me 24-7, and I get caught up in this thing sometimes where I don't know. I'm like, I don't know what to do because if I, it's like, it's like you get overwhelmed with how many lost people there are. Does that make sense? And, I, and, and it burdens me because it's like, okay, there's this guy banging on the corner, but then what, if I spend two hours with him, what about the 3,500 that walk by me in the next three seconds? But we, so this is, the point is, is I get hit with this burden, and it just gives me a cry to say, God, you have to raise up your laborers. You've got to shake your church. We are playing way too much games. Yeah. We're spending 40 hours a week inside of our church offices planning church stuff. It's unbelievable to me. If God wants to build your house, let him build it. You don't have to have 40 hours of strategy meetings. There's a whole world dying while you're trying to build your church. You see what I'm saying? I know I'm looking at evangelists talking, but guys, if all of, if, imagine if the whole body of Christ got hit with this. 100,000 people on, where is that in the Caribbean where you guys are going? St. Vincent. St. Vincent. There's only 100,000 people there. This room right here alone could reach that whole place in 10 years. If they were faithful. And my heart is to see a whole, just the whole body of Christ getting baptized in love, coming out of religion, coming out of the foolishness, coming out of the, we're striving so hard to, to please God when God's just like, dude, listen, relax, you please me, you don't have to do anything for me, just get out there and go show me to somebody. Yeah. Did you know that evangelism is actually one of the greatest forms of worship that we have? It's not a work. It's not a work. Do you understand that? Evangelism is not something separate from worship. That was close. <laughs> Ow! That water was inching. <laughs> um, guys, going out and being a witness, doing missions, all of those things, it's all worship to the Lord. We've got to get out of compartmentalized Christianity. We've got to get out of what we think. You no, know, we've got to get out of all of that and recognize that it's all worship to the Lord. That everywhere I go, in my quiet time, in my whatever, my life is a fragrant offering to Jesus. And so when I'm out laboring for the lost, I'm getting oil in my lamp, not losing a need to go fill up. I love Reinhard Bonnke, how he challenges that. And he's like, all these preachers and these singers, they say, here's my cup, Lord, fill it up. You know, like, you ever write or talk about that? He's like, last I checked, we have rivers. Yeah. It's not measured by cups. You know, right now, you know, right now it's just, he'll be there to challenge you, you know? And so my point is, guys, is I want us to begin to purpose ourselves for a mission. Yeah. And that mission is, I, I want to lay, I want us all in this room to lay our lives down. Uh -huh. 
for the sake of the world. You know, that song by Brian Johnson, for the sake of the world, burn like a fire in me, guys. Yeah. I want you to lay everything down. And more than just now that you're getting this revelation, go do something. I also want you to contend in the secret place and say, God, I am not satisfied with what I'm walking in. I want more. I want more. I want more. Dude, I'm crazy enough to believe that. I, I fasted 21. I don't say this with righteous, you know, spiritual pride. We fasted 21 days for the mantle of William Branham at the beginning of this year. I began to read the biography of this man's life, and I said, I'll do whatever it takes, God, give it to me. And I just did what I went for it. Fasted 21 days. I don't know if I got it or not. But the point is, is we got to continue to be crazy oh, enough because, guys, the world depends on us. The guy that's dying of cancer depends on us. Yesterday morning, before I flew here, I had to hurry up and get to the church in Manhattan because I, I forgot it's my cleaning day. This is what leadership looks like. I'm the janitor also. So I have to mop and vacuum. And so I was like, I had to leave super early in the morning to be able to make it to Manhattan. So do the full deep clean to then be able to get back to pack my suitcase to fly here. And you know what? I could have been so prioritized with my chore and my duty. But then this man gets on the subway. And right when we're, right when we're coming underneath the river from Brooklyn to Manhattan. And he starts talking about, he's got all these bandages. He can barely walk. He's dying with stage four bone cancer, all this stuff. And I have a choice to make. I have a choice to make. I gotta hurry up and get to work. Or I got this man right here who's dying with stage four bone cancer that everyone is completely ignoring. And so I got off the subway and I hung out with this guy. And I shared the story of, of Glenn Hicks, how we prayed for him and he got healed with stage four bone cancer. And I prayed for this guy. And I believe God's gonna heal him. And so I want to call you guys into a life of just saying there's nothing else that matters. Come on. Nothing else matters at the end of the day. Your ministry doesn't matter. Your preaching engagement doesn't matter. Your Baldwin jeans doesn't matter. Your all of whatever you do, your Yeezy boost. Okay, so who, okay, funny story. Rabbit trail. Who knows about, you know, the Yeezys, right? So like if you're in the shoehead world, you know, the Yeezys are a big deal. You can't touch them under 3,000 Yeezys, right? So funny story. I'm at this... This is, okay, this is funny. Here it goes. It has nothing to do with God at all. <laughs> so, so, so they, so there's this little area called Seaport in, in Manhattan. So it's it's right down by Wall Street. It's this really cool area down by the water, right? And there's this, there's this, there's this thing called the Smorgasburg. And you walk in there, and it's like seven restaurants. So it's like pick your line, and you meet at there's seven different kinds of food. Pick your line and go get your food. Right? <laughs> so I got my son, right, and I'm back in the stroller, up, and I just crunch on this dude's shoes behind me. I mean hard, you know, like, like, and I turn and I look and it's this huge black dude covered in ink and he's got a pair of Yeezys on. So I, I back right in and just scuffed his kicks, man. And I'm just like, <laughs> and I look up at him, this guy's like 6'5". And I'm like, bro, those are Yeezys. Are those real? Here's what I said, here's what I said. I had to check, I said, are those Yeezys or those Yeezys? Because <laughs> there's, there's a lot of Yeezys out there looking really great. Yeah, Isaiah, Isaiah, I called him out on me. When I, I saw a video of Isaiah preaching like three months ago, and I texted him, bro, are those real or those feces? He goes, I know why they're feces. <laughs> he texted me back. But dude, I stepped on this dude's easy so hard. And he was, he was legitimately offended. And I was like, bro, I'm so sorry. I said, I'm a shoehead too. I understand what I just did. I apologize, bro. And he just like totally didn't give me the time of day and just like walked away. He just he had nothing to say. <laughs> How funny is that? Right. <laughs> Stuff is things you know. We don't want three thousand dollar pair of shoes. Oh, just crunch. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, bro. <laughs> Anyways, I almost got hurt. Hey, my phone real quick. I want to read this poem to you guys. I want to read this poem to you guys that was part of the confirmation for us to move to New York City, and then I'm going to pray for you. I literally just thought of this on the spare moment. Give me a second to find you. Give me patience. Um, when we were praying about moving to New York City, um, a friend of mine who is, uh, here it is, a friend of mine who is mentored by Leonard Ravenhill, <clears throat> he lived in his basement for 10 years, one of the greatest men in God I know. This dude is an iron worker in Philadelphia, like hardcore iron worker. He eats four meals a week. Wow. He only eats dinner Monday through Thursday and then fasts Friday through Sunday completely. He's a maniac. He gets up at 3 a.m. He prays till 6 and then goes and works. And he like helped build the World Trade Center. Hard worker. Wow. 
And he's lived this way for 20 years, and he always tells me, one he goes, Josh, desire will let you do what I'm doing. Yeah. And this guy, he always sends me these crazy poems. He's, he, he just like reads these poems. Like, who does that? You know, I guess he, he used to tell me, he goes, every, every morning, Raven Hill, in the morning, we got to eat breakfast, because he lived in his basement. Raven Hill would hand him these poems to read every morning. And so we were praying about moving to New York City. Um, he sent me this poem, and my wife and I like literally like cried. Like, and I don't cry very much, and we just cried reading this poem. And, and I don't know who wrote it, but it, it, was, it was one of our greatest confirmations to move to New York City. And I, and I want to read it to you because it's a poem of the Lord asking us to lay down everything for his prize. So the guy says, I said, let me walk in the field. God said, no, walk in the town. I said, there are no flowers there. God said, no flowers but a crown. I said, but the sky is black. There is nothing but noise and din. God wept and said, there is more. There is sin. I said, but the air is thick and fogs are, va are, are, are veiling the sun. God answered, yes, souls are sick and souls in the dark are undone. I said, but I'll miss the light and friends will miss me. God answered, or friends will miss me, they say. God answered me and said, choose tonight if I am to miss you or they. He said, I, I, I pleaded for time to be given. He said, is it really hard to decide? It will not seem hard in heaven to have followed the steps of your guide. I, 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 look, I, look, I take one look at the field and I set my face to the town and God said, my child, do you yield? Will you leave the flowers for the crown? Then into his hand went mine and into my heart came he as I walked into light divine, the path I feared to see. This poem was written on my son's birthday by a guy whose last name was me. It could be prophetic, could be not. But the point is, is, you know, we're all trying to hold on to our life. This poem, could you imagine me about to move to New York City and he sent me that poem? I mean, unbelievable. And the point is, is we're all trying to go hard after God, but we're still trying to fulfill our dreams. And we are going hard after God. And, that's, and, and, and no matter what you're doing is great, but we're still trying to hold on to our dreams. We're still fantasizing about our future husband. We're still fantasizing about our future wife and what if one day I get married and have kids and a beautiful woman. And all those things are great and I bet you that God actually wants those things for you. I'm sure he does. But the problem is, is we allow the vision of what we think is a fulfilled Come life on. hinder us from a true laid down life for Jesus. Wow. Say it again. Women like Heidi Baker, who left everything, oh, a genius with a PhD, leaves everything with no money and shows up on a street corner in Mozambique. Right. You know? And we, we have to become a people where we've really got to draw a line in the sand and say, what really, are we really for real? I'm not saying you don't have a relationship with Jesus. I'm not saying you don't feel his presence. I'm not saying you haven't tied. I'm not saying you haven't done a lot of great things. But at the end of the day, if God says, give me that, will you? Whatever it looks like. And we have to be a people that are willing to surrender to this because there's a whole world out there that depends on your surrender. Good. For real, for real. And I want to call you guys into a life of being a faithful witness everywhere you go. That when you go to the grocery store, that when you, and I'm not saying I'm perfect at this every single day of my life. I'm not, I'm still, I'm still striving to be there. I'm still working towards that. But I want to call you guys into this life where you realize what you're really here for in the first place. Yeah. That when you go to the grocery store, yes, it's okay to go grocery shopping, but you have to realize that this whole grocery store is full of people that could die tonight and go to hell and have no clue about the joy and hope that you have inside of you. If, if a doctor walked up to you right now secretly and had a gallon of water in his backpack and said, hey, I want to let you know something. I met with my scientist buddies and they, we, we created this water. And every drop of this water, whoever it touches, the worst disease, the worst cancer, all you got to do is drop it on them and they will be totally good instantly. You would have no problem letting, laying out everything you're doing and you would take off with that gallon of water. You'd run into every single place. You don't care if the cops are trying to stop you. You don't care what gun is pointed at your face because you know that you have this water that will cure anything. Yeah. We have God himself. Oh. Not just some like thing called the Holy Spirit that God worked up with his scraps. You know, God, you know, God, God, God you know, puts, puts some of the scraps in the middle together and created this thing called the Holy Spirit and that's what we get. We get God himself, his nature, to the point that when Corinthians says that when I look in the mirror, I actually see God and not even my own self anymore. Wow. 
that when I look in the mirror, I'm not looking at Josh McDonald. I'm actually looking at Jesus Christ in the yeah. flesh. That sounds very good. Yeah. That when we look at it, we look at ourselves with unveiled face, seeing the image of God. That everywhere I go, the smell of who Jesus is is actually diffusing off of me. That so as he was in the world, so am I today. And guys, we have to begin to program our brains to realize this because the gas station needs you, the grocery store needs you. Listen, it's time to get out of trying to strive in outreach and it's time to live this thing as a lifestyle. Go do outreach. I'm planning an outreach in New York right now. I'm all for outreach. Kevin's coming pretty soon. We're doing Team Extreme in the middle of Times Square. Yeah. Breaking crap. It's be awesome. <laughs> so I'm all for outreach. But at the end of the day, there's only so much outreach, and there's 24 hours of the day that need to be lived out. Yeah. And not only do I want you to begin to program your brain to think like this, it's this simple. It's this simple. Every time you pull up to the grocery store and you're about to grocery shop, God, I know I'm here for something better than just groceries. Yeah. And what happens is, is when your brain gets programmed that way, you'd be shocked with divine appointments that have always been there that you were so dull to realize. Yeah. That's right. It's crazy. See, because I think this way, I now see it and I go, wow, I actually live for years not realizing that these, these deployments are in front of me every day. Yeah. And I thought, you know, it's, it's, it's hilarious. It's like, I, I'll be in line at the grocery store. And it just so happened that the lady with the migraine headache is in my line buying Tylenol for her headache. That's not a mistake. Wow. I'm pushing my son on the swings yesterday, and the girl is complaining the whole time, why well, don't need to see her chiropractor? Because I mean, it's just hilarious. Like, I'm always right next to him. But see, if you don't program your brain to think this way, you just go about your life minding your own business and have not a clue that every day God is purposely putting people in your path. Every single day, all day long. And so I want to call you to that lifestyle, but I also want to call you to a lifestyle of giving yourself to crazy fasting, to crazy prayer, saying, God, I want to dig up some wells. I want to tap into what the old guys tapped in. And I know right now that if you gave me Mount Carmel power, I'd probably make a million dollars off it real quick, and I'd probably do something really dumb. <laughs> See, because as we, as we grow with finances, even with power, and I know the, 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 the wave that's being preached today would just come against me so hard right now for saying I'm telling people they have to earn power from God. You do have to earn power from God. You don't have to earn his love or acceptance or anything like that. You can't earn those things. No matter how much you fast, God loves you when you were still watching porn and having sex with your girlfriend. He didn't love you any more than he did then. I'm not talking about that stuff. I'm talking about... There's waves of authority that God has given to Heidi Baker because of her sacrifice that you and I haven't even entered into yet. We haven't, we haven't paid the price that Heidi has to walk in when she walks in. We all want to walk like Todd White. Well, he's been fasting water every other day for two years now. Every other day, water. He's insane. I mean, if you, if you find out what these guys go through and the testings and the trials and the sacrifices and what they have laid down, that's why they're walking what they're walking in. Not just because they're sons of God freely walking in stuff. No, there's a, there's a life and a price to pay, guys. And I want to call you into it because there's so much that you can walk in right now that's beyond your brain. But as you walk in it, don't get, don't get caught up. Don't get arrogant. Don't get haughty. Don't turn into the freak show. We have the crusade, the only one with power. Because that's what we've seen for so long. But we, I've watched over the past, I said this this morning to you guys. Over the past three years, I've watched a transition happen in the body of Christ. We're praying for the sick, seeing miracles and seeing healing. is becoming the new normal. Is it not? Yeah. It's so normal now to hear about a believer who's going to the grocery store and their waitress is getting touched. Some of it because of Tom White. I mean, he's single-handedly changing the understanding of what it means to be a Christian across the whole world. I'm so grateful for it. But because of voices like Tom, because of voices like these people, it's becoming more and more and more normal. And what I'm concerned, though, is, is that as we're walking in what's available now, we don't laugh at the guy who's been in his closet praying for 40 days. Because when the rubber meets the road and God has to do a real transference in the kingdom, you'd be shocked that the guy that's seeing all the sick healed actually will get left behind while the guy that's done the class for 40 days instantly gets hit with something because he's mature to walk in it. So I want to call you into both of those realities. Because there's more available for you right now than you could ever imagine. And I'm going to lay hands on you guys tonight. My life has been drastically changed by showing up at altar calls, by willing to drive across the country because a man of God's in town and they laid hands on me. I have had three or four of those moments in my life that have changed me for a lifetime where a man of God has put his hands on me and it's been instant change overnight. And I've had the privilege now of being on the other end of the fence where people have come to me who are struggling because they're not seeing miracles or whatever. I lay hands on them and the next day from there on out they go on walking in the stuff. Wow. And so my heart tonight 
It is that good that way. You guys are going to get that, okay? okay? It's 9 o'clock. I'm done. I'm done preaching. We're going we're gonna, to um, Amen. Shout me down. Run for it. Run for it. Come on, there we go. Run for it. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Out of your seat and come right now. Woo! Yeah, the ones that are going out, Father, just bless them right now with a double portion. A double portion of everything he's ever seen, Jesus. So, so the students, uh, the ETS guys that are being sent, come on up here. And we're going to send you guys right now. Yes. yes. As you guys are, when do you guys leave tomorrow? Wednesday. Wednesday, okay, okay. So, Father, I just thank you right now in Jesus' name. Everyone, stretch your hands towards him. God, everything that they're walking in right now, I'm asking for double to come. I'm asking for double it, God, that they would be radically changed. That the, it's the Caribbean, right, Jason? That the Caribbean would never be the same. God, I'm asking for shadows to be healing people. God, I'm asking for the craziest stuff. I'm asking that when they even walk into a restaurant, that the place gets cleared out. God, I'm asking for revival that comes without even preaching, God. I'm asking for a fear of the Lord to hit the Caribbean, God, that doesn't matter what they say, just power breaks out. And God, I ask that you heal him before he goes. In Jesus' name, right now, impartation and fire. Impartation and fire. Let this mission trip change their life forever, God. I'm asking for what Branham walked in, Jesus. Branham would call them out by their address and all those things, but I'm asking for what Branham walked in. That you get a double, double it, double it. I'm asking for a double portion to come on their lives.